Hi. Um, sorry if I'm a little shaky. I just somewhat got here today. But when um, Devin was talking, I reminded me of a situation that happened with me that I think is important to share that I've been afraid to because it's kind of hard to talk about adults in a very adultist world when you're a youth. So I want to talk about how Devin mentioned in his speech how there are people who are afraid to walk through the nonviolence institute doors yeah. in my freshman year of high school i went through a very sensitive situation and i was asked to go into a room with cedric and i remember i was very emotional i was very fragile i had something you know terrible happen to me and i didn't know what to do or think i'm having a meltdown i'm crying and you know little 15 year old me sits down there's cedric right in front of me and i'm getting my emotions out and he looks at me and says stop crying look up at me and what am, I, what am I supposed to do like I'm trying to I'm here being vulnerable and this is what it said to me and Cedric I don't know if you remember that but I clearly do and unfortunately many other youth do as well because although I didn't talk about this situation people still find out what happened and because of that there are many other people within my high school year who have graduated this year within many other years in my high school who were actually afraid to now talk to Cedric because of what happened to me. They told me how because of what they heard, they didn't feel safe going up to Cedric or his little posse of people as well because these were also pro-police people and they knew that these people were just not gonna be able to help them. So all these youths that were in my year, dozens of them were silenced just from this one situation that trickled down. Not only that, but I just, Imagine how do people feel when they come out of prison, they have no resources, and they think this institution can help them. But yet again, like what Devin said, there's people afraid to walk through those doors. So when they think they can get resources from here and they're afraid because they're afraid to be judged, where do they go? There's nowhere to support them. There's nowhere. But I can tell you one thing. The people who signed that petition, that letter, those are the people who can help support. But how can we do that if we have no funds? Right. Like, this is a capitalistic world, so let's be honest, we need the money to support them. Right. We they need housing, like everyone has said. There is literally no houses in Rhode Island. And if they are, they're literally fucking expensive. They're out of range. Food, how are they supposed to get food? You gotta think about other organizations too that didn't sign that petition that turn away people just because of how they look. We have to think about all of that. We have to think about how they got no clothes to wear in the summer when it's fucking hot. No clothes in the winter when it's mad cold here because the state just wanna be like that. It's just crazy. It's all over the place. So I wanna speak about that situation because again, it's important to realize how I actually used to be a youth who would attend non-violence institute meetings to talk about the ways that we could improve our communities through non-violence tactics. And I always push for counselors, not cops. If y'all don't know what that campaign is about, it's a campaign to push um, cops out of schools and invest more mental health counselors, like emotional support for our youth, which is super important in our time. When we see that cops in our schools are shooting these kids down, they're tackling these kids, they're harming them and traumatizing them. So with that all being said, when youth voices weren't being prioritized, adult voices would be prioritized. And when adults were saying the same thing, saying how cops aren't it, he would then prioritize cop voices. So it's just a turnaround that keeps going over and over and over. It's always cops first, no matter what. They could have been his colleagues and he still denied them. And I know it because in those meetings, you always hear how there was employers who were actually being threatened because they were trying to speak up. How there was employers that were actually laid down or they were threatened to be because of trying to speak up saying that cops weren't it and what they were saying was wrong and what they were doing was wrong as well. So with all that, I want to mention how Cedric used to work in a school, the Met High School, that doesn't have cops. We're a very privileged school and I'm forever grateful that we don't have cops and instead we have counselors. And I'm very grateful that when Cedric told me to stop crying and to look up, my counselor told me to keep crying and to not look up to look down and get your emotions out. And that's what I did. And I'll never forget her and all the people that helped me in that school. Unfortunately, Cedric was not one of them. So when I saw him in my graduation, you know, I was a little despised, not even a little, I was. So it doesn't make sense how you worked in a school that pushed for no counts, for no cops, and yet you're over here preaching cops. It just doesn't make sense. So. 
now he's on our advisory board, and I just want to say how I'm going to get you out of that advisory board. Like, I don't know what makes you think you're going to stay. All right.